Welcome, everyone. My guest today is Managing Editor James Kleiman. To wrap up this week's news, which includes a potential change to FHA's life of loan requirement, updates on the recent cyber attacks, and M&A activity among lenders. James, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, we're back. We are back. Yeah. You know, we're going to cover a pretty wide range of topics today, just, you know, what's happening in the news. And the first topic is just so sad to me personally, I know to so many people, to you, to the industry, and that is the passing of Dave Stevens, who is just, it's hard to describe him and what he's meant to the mortgage industry. You know, um, he had a long battle with cancer, but it was still pretty shocking to everyone um, yesterday on uh, January 17th when we found out that um, he had passed. Yeah, really sad. I, Dave has always been a really outspoken, independent advocate for the industry. He was beloved by so many people. And and a lot of the comments that I received and, and saw on social media really reflected that I think there's going to be a big void to be filled, a leadership void, an unofficial void of, of someone who had a lot of political capital, a lot of influence, and a lot of love for the industry. I struggle to think of people who are more dedicated, more devoted to improving the industry and also giving people who are lower middle class an opportunity at home ownership. And he was a really fierce advocate for all that. And, and we had a reporter who only spoke to him just a couple of days prior. And so, you know, despite having um, been battling prostate cancer for many years, I think since 2016, um, a lot of people were were very surprised to hear uh, the very sad news. So um, definitely a loss for the industry. And we hope that his family is um, doing as well as they can be in this moment. We really do. And I think that, you know, uh, at his time at MBA, he was a fierce advocate. And then when he left MBA, I feel like he could be, he could be unleashed a little bit, right? And and really um, say some things and be an advocate for the industry in a whole different way than in that sort of very, you know, official capacity to be the guy holding people to account, uh, saying things maybe the MBA can't say, right? Um, and in that way, just really uh, continued his legacy of like standing up for people in this industry and for homeownership. Yeah. And the NBA, obviously they have, it's a very big tent, right? They have so many different constituents. They don't always agree on a lot. They have to be very sensitive about political and lobbying matters. And there are so many things that officially they can't really touch or don't want to touch because it, it could just be too sensitive. Um, but Dave didn't have those constraints and, and he was a very opinionated guy and he wrote, so many articles and he, uh, he was very prolific as a writer in, in his later years. And, and so, um, it's a big loss. It's, it's a really big loss. It is a big loss. Well, moving on to other, other news, other things that are happening, we have quite a bit happening. Let's talk about the FHA and, and what they, uh, proposed this week about, um, the life of the loan, right? That this could, this could change the FHA product and, um, it has some pretty big implications, and I don't know that it's gotten that much. Uh, I mean, we've we've written about it, but it doesn't seem like it's it's landed um, the way that I would think. So, tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, so there's no specific policy proposal that has been unveiled or anything like that. Um, however, Marcia Fudge, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Secretary, she's sitting in an oversight hearing conducted by, I want to say it's the House Representatives of uh, Financial Services Committee. And uh, as a representative, Brad Sherman, Democrat in California, he brings up the issue saying, look, we need to address just the fact that the life of loan premium requirements for mortgages backed by the FHA is a major hindrance, right? And there are a lot of reasons that the requirements are in place. And uh, we also know that the administration has been looking at ways to make FHA loans more affordable for a class of people that have largely been priced out of the housing market. And so Marsha Fudge essentially tells him, look, I'm willing to look at eliminating life of loan premium requirements for mortgages backed by the FHA. Now, we don't know what level of priority this is. It could just be, look, she's in a hearing that lasts for like, you know, a million hours and it's draining. And she reflexively says, 
yeah, I, I don't like these either, right? Like I, I wish we could do something about it because it is so significant. And the FHA has already made big changes to MIP, right? The mortgage insurance premiums, they did slash them, you know, it was down to 55 basis points or whatever. Um, but when you really talk about the reasons that so many prospective homebuyers qualify for both conventional and FHA end up going conventional, I think like nine times out of 10, it's because of these end of life premiums that just, they go and they go and they go and they go until you refi or pay off the loan or die. Right. So it's, um, it, it could be a major, major change. I think it would also provoke a lot of people who were already worried about a sort of creeping idea that we're going to be a little less careful about the finances of some of these big institutions that have gone belly up to, you know, some extent in the last 20 years, right? So there were a lot of problems with FHA-backed mortgages back in the day, right? And I know that there is a much higher risk in general because they are willing to accept borrowers who have lower credit scores, who have blemishes, who don't have the same levels of equity in their properties. And you have a lot of capital concerns in the secondary market you know, with, with Gini investors, right? So I don't know how political, how political, I, I guess like oomph there is on an issue like this. Certainly you talk to the affordable housing advocates and a lot of policy folks in Washington, DC, and they say, oh my God, like that, that's the holy grail. Like we would absolutely love to remove some of these requirements um, or at least scale them back, right? Like maybe you get to the 20% and it's, it's gone. Maybe, maybe you lower it to even 15% equity, right? I mean, there are so many different ways you could do it. Um, if it's anything more than just a conversation at a stressful hearing in DC, you know, it, it's hard to say. And the FHA is not typically very candid, uh, you know, as to what they're internally thinking about in the moment. So what we could say is this was a tantalizing segment of of a very long hearing. Uh, much of those hearings are not very tantalizing, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely correct. But you know, you, you talk to folks in the policy world, and they say, "Look, an MIP cut is great, and we're happy that it happened, but it's not a game changer." You know, like nobody makes the calculation. Like, well, I shouldn't say nobody. There's only a select number of people who look at the MIP change that they did last year, two years ago, whatever it was, and they say, yeah, I, I'm going to go with the FHA loan, whereas if you did remove the you know, end-of-life requirement, it just it opens up like millions of potential home buyers, and so many people would benefit even you know, with existing mortgages. So I, I think it's a big, big prospect, probably not realistic uh, anytime soon, but it would certainly make for a mortgage product that is a lot more competitive with Fannie and Freddie. And we know that Fannie and Freddie have really narrowed their credit box, you know, over the last 15 years. They've been, I think, fair to say very conservative, right? And we know that the Biden administration and a lot of Democrats want Fannie and Freddie to be providing more opportunity to lower income, moderate income, uh, you know, people of color, people in protected classes, people in urban areas in rural areas. And, you know, for some of their requirements and, um, and guidelines, the GSEs don't, don't hit the mark. You know, they're not, they're not getting there. And, and some of those goals are very aggressive. It's not to suggest that they're not trying, um, but this would very much put the FHA on far more, you know, competitive footing as a product. Well, and we see that in the way that um, different different parts of the Biden administration are trying to chip away at some of the fees that are part of closing costs, or um, sort of the things that are outliers. I mean, they they can't go in at the at the main product, but they're like, okay, how do we, you know, let's look at title, let's look at appraisal, let's look at all the all the ways we maybe can do this, the credit score, the you know whatever it is. And so I feel like there's a concerted effort on the things that they can control. Yeah, but they also have a very mixed track record. And, and every administration does. This isn't to say, oh, well, you failed on this. And so we're, we're going to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's, I think in title, it's 
maybe a little bit more glaring. I mean, the administration through the FHFA, according to some Wall Street Journal reporting, essentially said, uh, you know what? We don't really want you to make as much noise as perhaps, you know, Fannie Mae had intended to make in, in running a pilot program that would essentially have Fannie kind of bear the risk and cost of title in specific cases. And that wasn't even, you know, a huge program or anything like that. Again, it's a pilot. It was it was just supposed to be um, a fairly small attempt at, you know, addressing affordability issues and saying, we don't believe that there's really all that much risk here when you consider that it only pays out, what, a couple percentage points, right? Like two, three percent. And so we can do that. <laughs> you know, Fanny and Freddie definitely have the money to do that, right? And so if the FHFA is saying, hey, we really want you through these equitable housing finance plans to think very hard about how to deliver actual huge savings to a consumer and what affordability is arguably at its worst point ever. Title's a decent place to start, right? If it only pays out 2 to 3% of the time, and, and I know there are a lot of advocates for title and, and think that it's essential and very much worth the tangible risk right? Because you could be losing the whole house. You could be losing the whole property if it, it ends up being that you didn't really have the proper claim. But again, if it's only paying out 2 to 3% of the time, the federal government certainly has enough money to bear that kind of risk if they want to. It sounds like they pursued it. And then naturally the title insurance industry says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing risky business anymore you remember what happened? Like, bad, bad Fanny, go back. And then a bunch of politicians start getting uh, keyed up about it and suddenly the program dies, right? So um, I think it's a pretty mixed track record. And like any administration, they're subject to political pressures. Now, Fanny is still doing, uh, you know, some other work related to title. They have those attorney opinion letters. It is a very small percentage of, you know, the overall business, um, but it could be something, and and it's certainly something to keep assessing because the title industry is going to try to beat back any attempt at uh, Fannie or Freddie or the FHFA or any kind of regulator saying here are the options available. They want it to be very clear uh, that title is the best, uh, most complete coverage option available, and that it is worth the cost. Uh, in, in every situation. So it's it's going to be a fight that we're going to see wage, I think, for many years to come. So we're keeping an eye on both of those issues. So the uh, FHA potential there uh, to change in the, the life alone, and then obviously always uh, the title bit. The next thing I wanted to talk about, which it feels like it's just coming at us all the time, is the cybersecurity incidents that we've seen. So we uh, we had a story about First American um, this week, kind of looking at their Q4 financials. So they had that breach on D December 20th, 22nd, yeah, something like that. Just before Christmas. Just before Christmas. What did we, uh, what did that uh, report find? What did that um, story talk about? So we, we don't know materially what the impact will be. We know that they have told their investors through an SEC filing that there is going to be a major change, that they're going to make less money in Q4 as a result of this. I don't think that's a huge surprise. We know that there were a lot of closings that were delayed as a result of uh, them either shutting down their systems or having had them shut down from the hackers. Uh, we still don't know a lot of the details, although their systems are up and running. But yeah, I mean, some of the closings probably got delayed by a couple of weeks, right? So that's going to show up in Q1, or maybe they ended up going with a different title company. They I think it's fair to say they probably lost some business as a result. There were a lot of frustrated people out there. Uh, totally natural. What we expect to see in all these cases, right? I mean, you remember, I want to say it was over the summer, Rapitoni got hit. They're, you know, a pretty big player in the MLS space. And they lost a lot of business as a result of the hack. So many people went over to, I think, CoreLogic has system that's gained a lot of popularity and, and there are others, right? So um, other companies will seize upon the misfortune of others. That's business. It's cold, but you got hacked and there are still customers that need to be served. 
and they're going to do their damnedest to try to serve those customers, right? I, I mean, it's it's unfortunate all the way around. And so often what we see is these hacks are perpetrated by nation states. So you see a lot of these coming from Russia. You see a lot of them coming from North Korea uh, or their smaller collectives or whatever. But these are very, very significant incidents. They're hard to catch. They're hard to stop. Even big companies that have invested millions of dollars in preventing it get hit. You know, look at a, a Mr. Cooper, for example, one of the biggest mortgage servicing companies in the country. You don't think they've spent a lot of money on cybersecurity? They absolutely have. They got hacked, you know, and, and so, and they were going to lose, I want to say it was something like $15 million or less, but still like, you know, a lot of money and, and their systems went down. They have a lot of issues with customer complaints. And, and I think what's interesting is what we see in almost all the cases is you don't see a tremendous amount of like messaging from the company that was attacked and the consumers. What they usually do is they have a website that has been set up to communicate with consumers and they'll have updates that are very vague and say things like, we have been, you know, the victim of a cyber attack and we have identified, you know, three systems that have been breached and we have nothing else to say. Check back for updates. A couple days pass. We have restored this one very minor thing that has nothing to do with the customer experience. A couple days later, you know, another thing is back online, whatever, but it's just, there's not a lot of communication. I don't know if that's because they're talking to law enforcement and law enforcement says, you don't want to provide updates. You don't want to give the hackers any sense of what you're doing to restore systems or to fight things or they have attorneys or compliance people who say you don't want to be putting up information that you're not 100% sure of and that will potentially result in more. Eight lawsuits, I think, for one of the title companies that got hit pretty recently. Um, so, so those are big factors. I think another thing to talk about is the impact on the other side, right? So the consumer experience, awful. If you're trying to close a home, that is terrible news. It must be so frustrating. I can't imagine how frustrating that might be. But think if you're the loan officer, think if you're somebody at the title office, you know, you're a closer, you're even an agent, right? And you're looking through the portal, trying to figure out what's going on with the closing and crickets. It's so frustrating. And I, I think that, um, you know, so we see this with Loan Depot. So L Loan Depot got hacked now like two weeks ago and trying to get information. So, you know, our job at Housing Wire is like, how, how can we get information out to people? And it's just you know, there's no information that, that they're, uh, um, the site they set up, same thing, you know, updated every couple of days, but really no information. And so people are just stuck. I know, um, I know of someone here who's, uh, working with a builder who, you know, their, their financer is actually Loan Depot, right? It's not called that, but, um, they're, they're partnering with Loan Depot. And so just complete shutdown for two weeks, haven't been able to do a, uh, purchase application, can't take any, you know, can't do pre-qualifying, you know, just for this whole two weeks, um, nothing's happening if you're a loan depot loan officer. And at this point, like that's rough. That is, you know, it's not like you're flush with cash from 2023. Yeah. And, and that's really hard. We don't talk enough about the logistics and, and what you need. You probably don't have a lot of databases that you can be looking for. And mortgage rates, by the way, not that they're in, in an amazing state or anything, but they're at like relatively low rates compared to the last year, right? They're in the mid sixes. And so I'm hearing from loan officers in the field that they're even doing some refi business. But if you're at Loan Depot and your system is down, pretty hard to get that list of potential refi opportunities out there, right? So it's probably just triage for a lot of folks who are actively working on deals. And, you know, you can't even think about being more proactive in, in terms of, you know, harvesting old, old business and, and trying to look for opportunities there. It's, I imagine just doing as much as you can to serve the customers uh, that are, you know, in front of you. Absolutely. Yeah. I always think about, um, you know, back when I first started at um, Housing Wire, a couple, a couple of years in the CFPB launched their consumer complaint database. 
And, you know, that could be for anything. I mean, it's not just about mortgage, but especially back then it was a lot about mortgage and they would check that. And you just think how frustrating this is for the consumers, all that. But really what, to your point, what can anyone do about it? I mean, it, you know, when we go to conferences and we have experts speak about this, there's so little that you can do even after the fact, you know, so it, it's just a frustration for everybody. I'm, I'm interviewing tech executives every week and every week I ask them, you know, what keeps you up at night? And a couple of weeks ago, I just happened to be interviewing the um, CTO at Lone Depot. And he was like, you know, security keeps me up at night as everyone I've ever talked to, because I'm talking to tech executives have said, and he's like, you know, I think if that's not keeping up at night, you're not doing your job. And, and then to see that, you know, knowing that that is absolutely what he's focused on it, you know, it's going to happen to almost everybody at some point. And I think it probably happens a lot more than even we know, right? So if you're a Mr. Cooper, if you're a Lone Depot, you're a publicly traded company, uh, the big four title insurance companies, right? A lot of big mortgage servicers, you have to disclose this. There are some new um, federal laws that require a little bit more disclosure. And so sometimes we'll see things like Academy Mortgage disclosed uh, a cyber attack that they had in like early 2022 quite recently, right? And so I think that's probably just because the rules now stipulate that they have to do that. Um, but it's not relevant to a customer today unless there was some sort of a breach and their data were exposed and they now, you know, need to go through this whole process with say the credit reporting agencies or whatever. But think about the level of resources that some of these really big companies that we're reporting on have versus the less than two billion a year IMB who maintains some servicing how much do you think they spent on cybersecurity in the last couple of years? We're talking about companies that in a lot of cases are staring at potential shutdowns or M&A because they don't have a lot of options. Can we expect the industry as a whole, such a boom bust industry in a lot of cases, to be consistently investing in something like this? Maybe there has to be a bigger conversation or some sort of a collective, maybe you know, because everyone is at risk. And, and I do think that it harms um, the industry's reputation as a whole when any of these companies gets attacked because yeah, every day in the news, you're like, oh man, a mortgage company, a mortgage servicer got hit. Oh, a title insurance company got hit. And well, naturally the, the hackers are going to keep targeting these types of companies because they have all the sensitive data. They have all the social security num numbers. They have all of the pertinent information because it's required as part of issuing a loan, right? You don't hear about it so often at like a JP Morgan Chase or a Wells Fargo because these banks have like infinity resources and they know that if there is a hack, I mean, it has so many implications. This is not to suggest that the industry hasn't, um, you know, prepared on some level, they don't have the same resource situation as a whole, but does it need to be thought of in a different context? I, I think that's really important. I mean, especially, I mean, you think about it, like, I know that the um, federal government has the whole thing. If you've, if you're, if you've been the victim of a ransomware attack, for instance, there's a way to report that there's like a protocol, but generally speaking, if you have a cyber incident, you're kind of on your own. I mean, we, we outline at different things, like here are the things you need to be doing. Do you need to have this insurance? You call in this company. But if you're fighting against a nation state, it feels like you almost need the, you know, the resources of a nation state at your disposal to fight it. And, and there's really, it's not there. I mean, you, good luck, basically. So I know we, um, you're also reporting on a lot of things that haven't been made public yet. Suffice it to say, lots of consolidation is going on. Would you say that's a fair, uh, uh, a fair way to say it? There is some consolidation going on. It's less than I expected. It's less than a lot of folks in the industry expected. Is it in part because rates have dropped and the everyone's looking at the 10-year spread and saying, I can do this. I can, I can survive. I can make this work. Uh, I just need to motivate my, my army of loan officers and, and have a better second quarter and I can do it. We are hearing about some deals. We are hearing that a lot of distributed retail companies that have pretty big budgets that have kept some of the cash that they made 
from 2020, 2021, part of 2022, that they are interested in teal making. Um, we definitely see it a lot more in sort of the branch model and p and um, But it's not as much as maybe we anticipated. I, I think if rates had remained in the mid sevens for a couple months longer, we would see a lot more activity. Uh, we hear that there are still conversations taking place and there are still meetings and there are a lot of CEOs who are still thinking about, hey, if this doesn't really improve enough, who's my dance partner? Um, but we don't see a whole lot of deals actually being consummated. Uh, it is Thursday, January 18th. I've spoken to multiple people today who say that there is a deal happening between um, two fairly good-sized IMBs, one smaller around kind of the $2 billion a year range, one that's in the top 25, and um, and that would be one of the bigger deals we've had in, in a little while. I mean, certainly there are other companies out there that are fairly aggressive. CCM is among the more cross-country mortgage, I should say. Sorry, I'm so used to speaking in acronyms now. It's like I'm in the army. Um, but cross-country mortgage is still among the most aggressive recruiters out there. They don't just do deals for the sake of doing deals. They're looking for companies that are going to fit into their P&L model. They're looking at territories where they think they can materially grow pretty significantly. So CCM, for example, did a deal pretty recently to pick up AMCAP in Texas. It's an area where they're not I think they're not a top 10 lender and they want to get bigger, especially in the Houston area where we still see a fair amount of deals and there are still a lot of business to be won. Um, so we do see that sort of, I think, more opportunistic kind of transaction. Um, but then we also just generally see some recruiting. You still have a lot of lenders who want to pick up an entire branch, you know, in one fell swoop. In some cases, it's going to be easier for them to do that with an M&A deal. Uh, in others, they're just going to try to do what others would consider to be poaching uh, and and just kind of pick them up the old-fashioned way. But we, we don't see a whole lot of movement. And, and I wrote about this pretty recently in a LinkedIn post where I looked at 2023 originator data. So I looked at the top 100, sorry, the, the top producers in 2023, basically anyone anyone who did a hundred million dollars or more in 2023, and I try to figure out, did they move? Did they join a new company in 2023? And so we're talking about probably a hundred ish people, maybe a little bit more than that. Only five moved to a new company in 2023. And four of those five moved across country mortgage. The fifth went to U Mortgage, Anthony Casas' shop out in Philadelphia. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And there wasn't a lot of movement in 2022 either. Really very similar numbers. There were a couple more who did move. We do see a lot more movement in that sort of like $25 million to $50 million range. I haven't finished my analysis. It's a lot of manual work to look at the data and then look at the NMLS license and my, my computer is probably going to die. You're going to have to buy me a new computer at the end of the week, Sarah. But my point here is there were so many LOs who left in 2020 and 2021 and they signed retention agreements and they got big bonuses and the money was a lot more free flowing when the market was much better. No surprise there, right? You don't see the same level of bonuses being issued in 2023. You don't see companies being as aggressive because even though everyone needs production, there's a certain tipping point where, well, okay, let's say I want to get this $100 million team to get them over. I'm going to have to pay in, let's say the $5 million range to bring them over. And is that going to be a $5 million profit in 2023 or 2024, you know, in, in some cases, like maybe you bet on that and you say, I have enough cash. I have enough um, in my war chest where that's a good medium to long-term strategy, even if it doesn't totally pay off in 2023. Um, 
but most companies can't look that far ahead because, well, how many of them even made money last year or the year before that? You know, not a lot, right? So it's it's a tough conversation for them to have. And people are always opportunistically recruiting. It's a 1099 world. And, uh, you know, a lot of these loan officers have choice. But I think what we're going to see is a lot more movement in 2024. And from what I hear in the industry is a lot of recruiters and a lot of executives who are doing recruiting are targeting 2025 as a big year for top LOs to move. It just makes sense, right? I mean, by then we're going to have stable mortgage rates. I'm not sure where those are going to be, but they're not going to be uh, up and down so much, right? Because we'll be out of this uh, Fed policy, we, we hope, um, that, of, like, of raising- Who, who expected uh, COVID in late 2019? You know what I mean? Like there, there are always these, I don't know true. if you call that a black swan event, but I, I've, I've decided I'm, I'm no longer in the predictions game and uh, I'm, I'm going to do what some of the some of the companies do in their forecast, instead of doing yearly and really sticking your neck out there or even quarterly where you might look a little stupid, I'm going to do monthlies. I feel pretty good that like business will be <laughs> right, a little bit sense. better in, in January than, than it was in December, but not like amazing. And I'm not going to predict what the whole year of 2024 is going to look like. It's it, courage. It really does make sense. Okay. The, the last point I wanted to uh, bring up was some uh, interesting news from um, United Wholesale Mortgage, right? They had findamortgagebroker.com was, uh, was their tagline for people to, you know, not many people know how to find a mortgage broker. I mean, That's like if they, know, they barely know what a loan officer is. So it's like, okay, if, if you even know about a mortgage broker, so findamortgagebroker.com was their way of, of bridging that gap to consumers. They have changed that. And I think in an amazingly clickbait way that will get them more uh, views to, what is it? Mortgage, mortgage match? match. Yeah. Mortgage match, which sounds like a dating app. Nice. And so lots of people have been like, okay, so is this a way for people in the mortgage industry to find other people in the mortgage industry to All date? Right. But no, in fact- it's not. What what is it? Yeah, I mean it's it's basically just replacing find a mortgage broker.com, right? So it's consumer facing and they want to have um you know uh, maybe a little bit more light on the difference between a mortgage broker. I, the average consumer has no idea what the difference is between a mortgage broker and a mortgage banker. It is all just a guy or gal in mortgage. It's not something that they think about or care about all that much unless you've done it before and you've already had a mortgage broker. And although the wholesale channel has certainly been building up in recent years and UWM is a huge part of that, of course, uh, there are only, what, 16% of the market as of Q3, I think it was. Maybe they're a little bit more, but they have a lot of room to grow. And I think it's smart for them to try to get the consumer education a little bit closer to the reality of what's different about a mortgage broker and how to find one. Like, even though I'm in this business, when I was looking for a home in, I guess, like mid 2021, this is more of a weekend home, vacation home in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. I didn't know a mortgage broker in the Poconos. I didn't even know how to find one in that area. I probably should have remembered the find a mortgage broker.com, but I guess it didn't stick in my mind for whatever reason. Uh, mortgage match maybe would, or if it doesn't totally work out, they could pivot and create one of those dating apps. Like you said, there are a lot of uh, divorced folks in the industry, right? Sales often uh, is, is a stressful job. And uh, that's, so it's, you know, maybe not what they were going for, but I, I think they could pivot if it doesn't catch. You know what? So they've got backup. Um, well, anyway, that is a wrap of the news this week. Thank you so much, James, for being on and running down all these stories. Uh, looking forward to talking to you soon. Yeah. And I just want to remind everyone that I'm going to be in New Orleans next week for MBA IMB. And uh, I'm really looking forward. There are a lot of really excellent panels that should be taking place. And I, I'm really into cocktail bars and I like Cajun food. So if you'd like to meet up, please let me know. I'm at james at hwmedia.com. Perfect. Thanks, James. 